Well, good evening. This is Christian Bible Chapel, and we are here for our evening uh, service. I appreciate you joining us. I know this is a difficult time because this particular day, which is celebrated all over the world, the day called Easter, but we thank and praise God for being here this evening. Now, today we are continuing our expository preaching from the book of Mark, from the book of Mark. Such a challenging uh, passage that we're going to deal with here in chapter 9. So I pray God that we will come together and reason together to see what the scriptures tells us what Jesus is saying. So bear with me as we challenge ourselves in the word of God. Father, we come thanking you for the exciting teachings of the word of God, and we pray that you would guide us in your path and allow your Holy Spirit to teach us your word. Help us to overcome our weaknesses, our bias, our opinions, our doctrinal differences, denominational teaching and look to the Holy Spirit of God to give us the understanding of the Word of God. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Mark chapter 9, verses 43 to 49 is a Greek um, recital of the Hebrew Isaiah chapter 66. Let me repeat that. When you go to Isaiah chapter 66, you're going to see the same words used. Not exactly the same words, but the metaphoric description of what Mark is talking about here in Mark chapter 9, verses 43 to 49. So when we, when we, when we read this, we have to understand what Jesus is actually saying, not because of translators, commentaries, and somewhat, but what, what is Jesus actually talking about? That's what we want to know, because the Spirit of Christ is the author of the Scriptures. He is the written, He is the spoken word. We're reading the written word. Let's look, let's read. If your hands offend thee, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into lame, life maimed than having two hands go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Now, I'm reading the King James uh, translation of it. All right. Where the worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. If your foot offend thee, cut it off. It's better for you to enter a halt into life than having two feet to enter it feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where the worm dies not, the fire is not quenched. If your eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Where the worm dies not, the fire is not quenched. For everyone shall be salted with fire and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good if it, if the salt have lost its saltness, wherein will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves and peace one with another. Now, to understand this metaphoric uh, description of what the Lord Jesus is talking about, you have to understand that the Old Testament is based on, the New Testament is based on the Old Testament. The only thing new in the New Testament is the, the, the redemptive work of Jesus Christ and the epistles. Even John in Revelations, to understand the book of Revelations, you have to travel back to the sayings of the prophets of the Old Testament because John in Revelations is going to use words, okay, from the Old Testament, like beasts, nations, you know, goat, and different, you know, okay, the two witnesses and witnesses like that in general, okay? So here is no different. 
Jesus is using metaphoric words. The words mainly is because of the word translated from Jehina or the Valley of Hinnon or the Valley of Slaughter has been, you know, translated into what we call H-E-L-L, -L, hell. So when you're looking at this in Mark chapter 9, <coughs> verses 43 and following, you have to refer to what Jesus is talking about as Isaiah chapter 66, Jeremiah, <coughs> and the Chronicles, because they're dealing with the same passage of scripture. All right. Now, so let's let's follow me as we go over Mark 9:43, and then we're going to bring in other passages of scriptures because scripture has to interpret scripture. Now, I understand that, that in the English translation, the word hell, H-E-L, is put here because H-E-L is, -E is the old English. So you got old English, you got middle English, middle age English, then you have modern English, okay? Now, in between the middle English and modern English, which is what we speak today, there's an English which is spoken in Scotland and England today. That's why they seem like they talk different than us. All right? If you look at, well, Sherlock Holmes or different movies of the 1920s and the 30s and the 40s, and when it's being filmed in Scotland, Glasgow and England and, and uh, Portugal and Spain, you, you know what I'm talking about. But in the King James, the word H-E-L, which is hell, is the meaning for it means below. Below. Hell met. Below your head. The helmet is put on, but your head is below it. That's what the word hell meant. An ob object below, <clears throat> you know, okay? So when you look at it, the Old Testament declares various words which means the same as grave and it's shiloh it's shiloh in the old testament hebrew in the new testament it is a word called jehina g-e-h-e-n-n-a hades and tartarus right? now when we look at these words and we see what Jesus is saying here in Mark chapter 9, verse 43, we have to use Old Testament words because Jesus is walking still in the times of the Old Testament. Now, Jesus is speaking to the Jewish people. No Gentiles is around. In all cases, it's all the time Jewish people. And he's describing in metaphoric words about God's coming judgment upon those who reject the gospel, all right, and those who reject the Messiah, and those who reject the word of God from the prophets, those three times, okay? And Jesus, throughout his ministry, is going to elaborate on all three of those. So when he says, if your hand offended, cut it off. Now, obviously, I know in some religions, they do cut your hand off if you steal a lot or if your hand gets you into trouble. And people say, well, cut it off, literally. All right? And it's, it's, it's just like using the scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 when it says it's better to marry than to burn. And many people feel that word burn is burn in hell. You better get married or you're gonna burn in hell. That's not the meaning to it. You see how we use English, modern English understanding of a word that is expressed by Paul, James, John, and Jesus and the Old Testament prophets. And we use our words when it should be Hebrew and Greek. Because Hebrew is in the Old Testament, of course, the Bible is written in Hebrew in the Old, and the New Testament is written in Greek, K-O-I-N-E, Quan Greek. 
So when he says, if thy hand offend thee, cut it off, it's better for you to enter lame, enter into life main, excuse me, main, than having two hands to go into hell, into fire that never shall be quenched. Now, he uses the phrase, never shall be quenched. Then he uses the word itself, hell. Now, to get an understanding here too, you have to understand that Jesus is using, which is the Greek word, our English is hell, all right? Because of the, if you get an old Bible, old, old English Bible, like the, um, Matthew Bible or the Great Bible, all right, and what's another old one? Of Geneva. If you're reading it in the original English, old English, it's H E L. It's sort of like in the um in the English, the word stoop. In our English in America, we call it steps. Biscuits is what we call it. They call it cookies, okay, or cakes. So when they say, let me have a piece of cake in, in England or in English, all right, they're really talking about biscuits. We just normally just come out and say, give me a biscuit, pancake, piece of bread. So even though the words changes, the meaning of the word does not change. So here, when he says, your hands, both hands, go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. So this isn't the first time that Jesus expresses about judgment, destruction, what we call hell, Hades. And we got to be very careful because we don't want to use words that attract and draw in superstition and Greek mythology because Hades is that word because that's the underworld wherein the God, the so-called God, Hades, brother of Zeus and Neptune, he was the chief God or the chief person in charge of Hades. But we see the word hell, we see the word fire, and we see the word never shall be quenched. Now, the word originally is Jehina. And where do we come from? Where, why do we say that? Because of the word Shiloh in the Old Testament. Now, the reason why it's called Shiloh, Hades, Jehina, Shiloh and Hades actually is the grave. When a person died, they went through grave, the place of their fathers. They went to the grave, right? It wasn't looked upon as an afterlife or life continue after death, because if life continues after death somewhere, it's not death, right? So what Jesus is talking about is referring back to Isaiah chapter 66, so in your Bible, just go ahead and turn there because we're going to come to that uh, reading there. But you see, Jehina was a well-known, well-known <laughs> valley south of Jerusalem long before it became a dump. Now, what had happened in the book of Kings, and this is one of the reasons why Jehovah God judged swiftly and mightily against the 12 tribes of Israel, the 10 tribes of Israel, which was called Israel, because remember, the 12 tribes divided. Two went to the house of David, uh, Judah and Benjamin. The other 10 went to call themselves Israel. But God sooner or later judged both northern Israel and southern Israel. But the reason why God really, really did damage, severe damage to the 10 tribes is because the, the kings of Israel, that is the 10, the kings of northern Israel, 
they stoop so low to allow their people to offer their sons to the god Molech. And see, Molech, according to the Amorites and uh, the Gentiles, you had to offer your son to a please Molech. And you offer him on an altar and you burnt him alive. You tie the sac like a sacrifice, set him on set the sacrifice on fire, and that's it. The children of Israel knew better. That's why it was called the valley, soon be called the valley of slaughter. It was called the valley of Hinnom. Originally, it became the valley of Jehina. So when you read that in 2 Kings chapter 23 and 10, 2 Chronicles 28, 1 to 3, and 2 Chronicles 33 and 6, you're going to see that God forcefully told the prophets why he is swiftly judging the 10 tribes, Israel, because each king was wicked. I mean, all the kings was wicked. The only good king was the kings in the south, which was from Judah, and like Hezekiah and the rest of his, his son, Joseas, and things like that. Not, not son, but his grand, his, his father, Joseas and Hezekiah. But then the kings of Judah start acting up and force the people to serve and break the Sabbath. So just like Jehovah God punished Israel, the 10 tribes, and allow the Amorites, right? to come and captivate, captive them and, and put them in slavery, God allowed the Babylonians to come and get Judah. So everybody was in captivity. But God promised through the book of Daniel, through Daniel's words and prophecy, that after the 70 weeks, after the 70, 70 years, that they was going to be free. All right? Now, follow me again. As we go to Isaiah, I mean, excuse me, yes, Isaiah chapter 66, I want to show you something. In Isaiah chapter 66, we begin our reading from verse uh, 14 uh, all the way up to the end, verse 24. Now, bear record of what Isaiah is talking about, all right? He says, for behold, the Lord, Jehovah, will come with fire. Right. Now, again, as Jesus was referring, even as John the Baptist, he says, the Holy Ghost will baptize you. Jesus will come and baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Obviously, nobody baptized me. The Spirit didn't do us with fire, right? So you got to think biblically. You got to think biblically and, and think logically with the, with the scriptures, right? Because fire... It's not our fire. That's why we get so confused with hell, the phrase hellfire, where the fire dies not unquenched. And we look at fire as our fire, like on the stove, on a campfire, or in, a, in an incinerator where you burn uh, cremate bodies. Fire, our fire. It is not so what the scriptures is talking about. Fire in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament, mostly in the Old and the times of Jesus' days, was, means, not was, but means destruction or judgment. Now, when, when fire is used to destroy a city, a country, a town, it specifically tell you that the Lord rained fire on Solomon and Gomorrah. You see that? He rained fire on Solomon and Gomorrah from heaven. Right. Now, according to the context of Isaiah and with Jesus saying this in Mark chapter 9, the fire is judgment, is destruction. Now follow me. Here we go again. Isaiah 66 and 15. For behold, the Lord will come with fire. With what? Judgment. And with his chariots, like a whirlwind. Now, obviously, 
the Lord is not going to come with fire under his belt, under his foot, under a fire, a chariot of fire. Or, okay, so we got to think this thing according to what the scriptures is saying. Fire here in Isaiah 66 and 15 is judgment. The Lord is coming with judgment. Even in the second coming of Jesus Christ, he's coming with judgment, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Now, I know you're there at, Josh, at, 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 at Isaiah, but just stay there. Uh, it just it dawned on me uh, to turn to this passage of scripture to, to, read, to, to read it, to let you know what I'm talking about. Now, in 2 Thessalonians, you don't, you don't have to read, but I'm going to give you the scripture, you just write it down. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, it says, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulations to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall reveal with, from heaven with his mighty angels, hagios, not saints, hagios, in flaming fire, taking vengeance. You see that second Thessalonians chapter one, verse eight, in flaming fire, in flaming fury, judgment. So it's not the fire that we know as the fire on our stove, the campfire, the fire that what we know in the English language. So that's how you interpret the scriptures. You just can't take it literally. You have to look at it metaphoric or figurative according to the text. Now I use that in 2 Thessalonians 1 and 8, uh, 1 and 8, because he's coming back. Uh, he's coming back. He's in flaming judgment, taking vengeance. See, that gives you the meaning in flaming judgment, in flaming fire, taking vengeance. How is fire is going to take vengeance on humans? I mean, you know, even in Second Peter, when we get there, it talks about what? Fire. The heavens and earth is going to be on fire. Really? All right. So we're looking at this, what the scriptures is saying. So if the heaven and earth is going to be on fire, um, if we take that literally in 2 Peter chapter 3, then that means that the heavens and earth is going to be burned up. Wherein in the Old Testament, when it talks about fire, only when the text says that it's going to be consumed or it's going to be destroyed, that's when he's dealing with the word F-I-R-E in a little term. But then you say, well, how would I know when to, to use literally figurative or metaphoric according to the context? Back to Isaiah 66. For the Lord will come with fire and his, his chariots like a whirlwind to win, render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flaming of fire. See that? See, notice the context. His rebuke will be like unto a flame of fire. Now, you know, when you get close to a fire, a flame, it's going to burn you. It's going to hurt. So that means that his rebuke, when he comes back, it's going to be intolerable. It's going to be unquenchable. It's going to be fearful. I'm using the word unquenchable for a purpose. Verse 16, for the fire, for by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh. Look at the context. Verse 16 again, for by fire. Should we take that literally or metaphorically, which is figurative, or should we take it literally? Again, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9, bear witness with that. The slain of the Lord shall be many. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the garden behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination. So here we see 
that the children of Israel is doing something they had no business doing, just like in the book of Mark. Remember when this Jesus came across this guy, he was uh, uh, holding, he, he was, he had a sheep, he had a pig farm. Let's just say that. Now, you know, no Jews have no business being, having anything to do with a pig, swine. But this guy saw the prophet in it. And when Jesus came, he rebuked him, the demons, and the demons asked him, can we go into the pigs? The pigs, the demons went in the pigs, and the pigs ran off on the cliff. The man came to Jesus and said, get out of our country. Get away from here. Who you think you are? Now, Isaiah co continued to tell the religious people, I know your works, verse 18. I, I know who you are. Sounds like John, right? One of the uh, letters to the church of Sardis or Pergamos or Titea, he says, I know those that say they're Jews and not Jews. But for time's sake, let's just go down to verse 22, 22 to 24. Here we go. For as the new heaven... And the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me. Uh-oh. There's a slight contradiction here because 2 Peter chapter 3 says the earth which being on fire shall be dissolved. Didn't Peter say that? So why is Isaiah saying something different from Peter? See, where you have a seemingly contradiction in a human mind, which is no contradiction in the scripture, it's because of us. You have to understand that the scriptures is using metaphor or figurative lingo, language. All right? For as the new heaven and new earth will I make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. It shall come to pass from one, from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, says the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the caucus of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. And they shall be in a boring unto all flesh. Now, what is, what is Isaiah talking about? Where, where is this place where there is a burning of flesh, a caucus, and worms, which is... The Septuagin Greek word is maggots is taking place in the valley of Jehina, in the valley of Hymnon. So you see, why have we ignore the teachings of the word of God of a physical place called Jehina or the valley of Hymnon and turn it into a spiritual place? where only souls go that have rejected Jesus Christ as Savior when they die. Cause the thought, right? So when we look at this, they shall look upon the caucus. The word is pegirem. Peg peg I'm trying to pronounce it in the Hebrew so you can I'm breaking it up in syllables as we're taught in English, right? P-E-G-E-R-I-M. It means dead bodies. And they shall go forth and look upon the... See, the, uh, the illustration is that Jehina, or the valley of Hymnon, was turned over to become a dump outside of, sit, of the city of Jerusalem. See, we as Gentiles, we, 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 we don't know nothing about this and and we don't know the customs and ways and culture of the Hebrews or the Jews of the Old Testament even up till the time of Jesus. So that's why we literally take the word hell as being what it means, hell. But it's Jehina, is the valley of Hymnon, the, the valley of slaughter. See, even when nation came against Israel, Israel made sure that the nations that they was going to battle met at that site because at that site, God was going to give them victory and their slaughtered ones was left there in the valley of Jehina or Hymnon. And it was just 
left there the rot and the maggots to eat up. And in order to keep the stench from flowing around and coming to Jerusalem, salt was thrown in there and a fire was always lit to keep dead bodies of dogs and animals or whatever burning and burning and burning outside of Jerusalem, way outside of Jerusalem, it was their city dump. So why have we changed this? It's just like saying, no, New York is not New York, it's, it's called Babylon. No, it's not, it's New York. You get to New York and you go to Manhattan and say, boy, this is Texas. What's wrong with you? We are in Ma Ma Manhattan, New York. This is not Texas, Dallas. So you can't call something another name. We can't make it spiritual. We got to keep it according to the text. So when we go back to Mark in our text right now, in Mark chapter 9 here, and not only in Mark chapter 9, we, we, as, as I was studying, I was looking at Matthews when Jesus was giving the commission uh, to the disciples in Matthews chapter 10. I was looking at this and you so-called prophets and, and, and so-called prophets and prophetess and apostles pay, take, take heed to this because this, this is talking to you too now because he, he sent out the 12 and he names them in Matthew chapter 10. He named them, he said, Andrews, Peter, Simon, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, uh, Matthews, uh, Levius, which is, you know, uh, Jude, Thaddeus, Simon, and Judas is carried. Judas, the one that betrayed the Lord. He sent them out. He gave them healing. He gave them power to cast out demons, raise the dead, heal the sick, and they did. Yes, Judas did that. All right. And when he said, and he says, "Go preach," saying, "The kingdom of heaven is at hand." He said, "Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you receive." And freely you have received, freely you give, provide me the gold. So where's all this wealth and money that you prophets and apostles are gaining, becoming millionaires and billionaires? You ain't supposed to have anything. The people are supposed to have that. The people are supposed to have what you got right now. This is a, See, Jesus says this is the identity of an apostle or a prophet. They don't do it for gain. Now, I was getting to the point where it says in verse 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as uh, serpents and harmless as doves. All right? And he keep on going until he gets to, he keeps speaking to them now. This is a whole sermon, a whole teaching to the apostles, directly to them. He tells them in verse 22, you're going to be hated by, my, and hated by men for my name's sake. And you're going to be persecuted when you go from one town, go to the other town. Just keep going town to town uh, because you're going to be persecuted. But notice what the Lord uh, was, was, is going to say here. He's going to give them, and as he keep on going, he comes to chapter 11. He keep on going. He comes to chapter 11. He made an end of talking to the apostles only. Now he's talking to the apostles and the people. And he brings in a couple of cities where the apostles did their miracles in preaching as well as he did. Now notice in Matthews 11, 21, 20, he says in Matthews 11, 20, then began he to unbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Corenza. Woe unto thee, Bethesda. For if mighty works which was done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, which are exalted into heaven, be thou brought down, King James, to hell, for if the mighty works which was done in thee had been done in Solomon, it would have been remained until this day. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Solomon in the day of judgment than for thee. Now, he, he doesn't only use here, Luke broadens it and talks about this same subject matter about 
Solomon and Gomorrah. Now, you know that Solomon and Gomorrah was burnt down. The walls, the walls, everything about because they was practicing homosexuality, bestiality, transvestite, every kind of sexual sins, Solomon and Gomorrah and the rounding cities were practicing. See, it wasn't just Solomon and Gomorrah, it was other cities too. It said, and you can read it now in the book of in the book of Genesis 19, this Solomon and Gomorrah was the main cities, but it was other cities doing the same thing. And he consumed them. He burnt it down. He killed the people. He destroyed. So when we get to Mark and we see in our text in Mark chapter 9, all right, if your hand offend thee, cut it off. If your eyes offend thee, pluck it out. You know? And each time he says, as your hands offend thee, cut it off. It's better such and such than to be cast into hell, Jehina, where the worms die not and the fire is unquenchable. Now let's deal with the phrase where the fire is unquenchable, according to Isaiah chapter 66, 2 Kings 23, 2 Chronicles 28, Jeremiah chapter 32. These passages of scriptures is talking about fire is talking about unquenchable fire so what 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 is it what does it mean so when he says here four times one verse 44 fire that is not quenched again in verse 45 fire that never shall be quenched 46 fire is not quenched 48 the fire is not quenched Again, you have to relate to Isaiah 66, 24, Jeremiah 7 and 20, Jeremiah 17, 27, to get the understanding when he says the fire is not quenched. It will never quench. It will never die out. So what are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus' usage of the dump or Jehina or the valley of Himnon outside of Jerusalem. But what we have done, we have exaggerated the word and make it a literal fire, a spiritual literal fire, that when a person rejects Christ as Savior and dies, that's where they go. And so we tried to bring Luke chapter 16 and other passages of scriptures into it, which has nothing to do with it, rightly dividing the word of God. Now, this is not a favorable uh, message. It's not, but this is why it's called expository preaching. You're going right on through the whole book, whether it's good, bad, or ugly in your sight, you have to preach it. And, and, and you notice one thing? You notice, let me tell you about, notice one thing? The Apostle Paul, who wrote, what, 13 of these epistles? Not once does he mention about a person dying and going to hell. Not once. You can read from Romans and all his epistles, not once. Now, if Paul says in Acts chapter 20, he says, I have preached and taught you the whole counsel of God. If the teaching of afterlife, when you die, afterlife, is so dominant in our century in our culture why did paul choose not to even say anything about it yes people will be judged they will stand before jesus christ now what of, of the the phrase it's not here but where it says there shall be weeping and wailing and gashing of teeth. Now that is sporadically says in the Old Testament. It's in when they killed, when they killed of Stephen, they were filled with anger and they gashed upon him with their teeth. Did they really just go in there and start biting on Stephen? 
wailing and gashing of teeth. What does these scriptures mean? Why did Jesus, why don't the scriptures, why don't Jesus say what he really means? He is saying what he really means. It's the point is, we're trying to use English, modern English usage. When I say modern in English, I'm talking about from um, 18 such and such up until now. We're trying to use that kind of English to interpret what Jesus is saying, and you can't do that. That's why the preacher needs to know at least some Greek or understanding some Hebrew and study the scriptures to find out. Because, see, you don't have to be a philosopher or a genius in Hebrew and Greek because if you, you're called by God and the spirit of God is in you, he is the author of the scriptures. And he will let you know what he is saying. So all you need to do is study the scriptures and stop riding on the back of denominations and what you was upbringing, your upbringing. Let me give you a point in question before we close. When I, when I first came to the apostolic, so-called apostolic faith, and um, I thought that this was something grand. I mean, you know, and the, the charismatic, the Pentecostal, the speaking in tongues, the rolling off the floor, and trying for the Holy Ghost, hey, if that means that I got to do that to get saved, I got to do it. And so many of us, we did that. So whether you went into a charismatic church, a Baptist church, a Catholic church, Presbyterian church, Methodist, Lutheran, whatever church, you fell in line with its teachings, you fell in line with the doctrine, the dogma, the creeds, the confessions, or whatever it was in that church. And you've been there for five years, 10 years, 20 years, 60 years, some of you, 90 years. And nothing moved you. Even when the truth is coming, you still reject because you're so loyal to the teaching of your pastor, your bishop, your church, your denomination, your creed, your religion. You refuse to allow the Holy Spirit to lift that veil from your eyes to let you see truth. And so, therefore, you stun yourself by saying, no, that's, that can't be right, because my church, our religion, our pastor, our bishop, our teachings is this. And so, when, it, when, it, when truth start coming, you, you hide from it, you reject it, you ignore it, because we are biased people. We have our opinionated understanding of the scriptures and none of that is 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 no good because the holy spirit is the author of the scriptures we cannot base our understanding on opinion and our bias which we are biased we are we might as well you know we're biased even if you call yourself a calvinist even if you call yourself a lutheran if you call yourself a whatever you're still biased because you have not submitted fully to the understanding and the teachings of the word of God. Point in question, wherein, wherein, when Christ comes back, what you will call the rapture doesn't happen as what people think the rapture is. Point in question, when a person dies, we say we're going to be with the Lord. When Jesus says, when I come back, I'm coming back and I'm going to receive you. You need a resurrected body to face me, you need a resurrected body to see me. A spirit and a soul can't see me. But yet we assume that after death, there's life. But the scripture doesn't teach that because it nullifies the word, the meaning of the Bible meaning of death. Because death doesn't mean separation. Because if death means separated, you're separated from God. You're separated from this body. You're separated from everything, and you go to heaven or you go to hell. That cannot be. You, you, it cannot be. Even if, for argument's sake, if it's true, that David says, if I ascend into the heavens, you are there. If I ascend to hell, you are there. Where can I go from your presence? So even if it is, the word separation doesn't mean death. So here in Mark, Chapter 9, when we say where the fire never shall be quenched. 
that Jesus is talking about outside of Jehina, the valley of the dead, the dump outside of Jerusalem, where dead carcass, dead bodies, both man, animals, and whatever you don't want, it, it, you throw it in there and it just burns. The guardians or people who watch over that place, they now and then throw salt to ease the smell and the smoke and the stench. And indeed, the fire does not go out. Indeed, it, there's, there's no quench. The fire is never quenched. It doesn't go out. It is an Old Testament figure metaphor of the Valley of Jehina, the Valley of Hymnon. That fire never shall be quenched. The fire is not quenched. But we have turned it into a spiritual place. The Romans and the Greeks, it says, it's in the earth. The Egyptian says it's in the sky, ruled by Ra, the god of the sun, who is the strongest god of all gods, Ra. But then here comes the Babylonians and the Amorites that says, no, it is Molech. And, 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 and when you put it all together, Satan has lied. They are all false gods, false theories, false teachings to get us to think that you're not really going to die. For the day you eat of it, you're not going to die. You're going to be just like God. You're going to live forever. Well, if you're going to live forever, what's the point of a resurrection of the dead? And that brings us to our Wednesday night class, the second coming of Christ and the judgment. Punishment and judgment is going to come upon those who reject Jesus Christ. Yes, they will receive punishment, and it will be eternal. That punishment will be so severe Repent of your sins and trust Jesus Christ before that day does come. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the blessed for the word of God, for the true teaching of the scriptures. We pray, Father, that our, our hearts, our eyes may have been opened in our minds, that we may be forced to see the scriptures in light of the scriptures. Scriptures interpret the scriptures. And we thank you, Father, for the teachings of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.